Lionel's gonna tell you all about his work, so I don't need to go too far into it, but, but I think for me it was important to say that it's, I think it's important, it's, it's impossible for me to overstate how influential this work has been, um, Lionel's work and, and with Rotor. Um, in terms of really pushing forward a conversation, I'd say in, in architecture schools, but also many other realms about material reuse, um, the kind of economic and ecological and social costs of, of um, wasteful construction systems, and really just trying to look like deep and hard at how things are being done and, and how they are inherently um, you know, problematic and wasteful and inequitable and um, in many different ways. And I think um, what has always been so inspiring about this, about your work and this practice has been this translation from um, your, Lionel is an architect and engineer, um, but moving from the kind of like theoretical into like, let's try to figure out how to do this. Like, how do we actually, how do we actually um, um, practice with these reused materials? And so um, I think in Toronto, in this area, um, the, the culture surrounding um, material reuse is really growing. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening this weekend at Design TO. There are, you know, last semester, Juliet Cook's class took students to, took uh, a range of students to, or to Ouroboros to do some deconstruction work. So there's, I think, a lot of really exciting um, stuff happening in terms of material salvage in the area. But one thing I have just always noticed is that whenever I'm in any of those contexts, everyone always is like, but you know, Rotor, <laughs> like, like you're just never not part of the conversation. And, and the, the model has been so, so important as a kind of like, I think just, just evidence of possibility. Um, so that's, yeah, just to say, I think we, we just have to I'm just so grateful for that, I think, um, and so many people are. And um, I also wanted, I, I had the, the great opportunity to visit Rotor last year and just the kind of immense kind of joy of the material, the materiality of this place, the mountains of urinals, the, the buckets of uh, ceramic tile being acid washed, um, just to really, and then also the kind of collective and the collective organization and intellectual curiosity of this place, I think also just speaks so much about the, the intellectual project. So um, Lionel is an engineer architect and historian, founded, co-founded Rotor in 2005, so that's almost 20 years ago. Um, has been involved in many aspects of, of that, but, and also many forms of, um, of architectural scholarship. He has recently shifted his attention to full-time teaching and material cultural history of architectural practice at Ghent University um, and has taught at many other institutions. Um, he's written an excellent reference textbook on building component reuse. Um, and I, I liked this from your bio that you said you're, you're now shifting to lessons to be learned from history on how to shift the construction sector out of its current resource squandering habits. So I guess that's what we're gonna hear about and uh, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Jane, for this uh, beautiful introduction, really um, very elaborate and, and thoughtful. And I must, um, I must say that I'm an absolutely huge fan of your work as well. Um, I was so happy to meet you last year when you came over to um, to Brussels and Ghent. Um, uh, that was an amazing moment. Um, and that confirms the fact that uh, traveling sometimes is, is an okay thing. Um, I, uh, as, as Jane pointed, I, um, let's say I'm trying to set myself some rules on, on uh, when or, or where I can travel to. And um, the, the rule I'm, I'm trying to elaborate for the moment is uh, to say that um, uh, if, if it's not a place where I can stay for more than three months, I, I will not fly to it. Um, but I say that because I'm, I'm over, uh, I turned 50 last year. I think old people should not fly that much anymore and, and leave the, the airspace to uh, the younger ones. Um, but I think you need to set some rules. Uh, in, I remember in 2006, I once wanted to invite Rob Hopkins, the founder of the Transition Town movement, and uh, to, just to come over from the UK to, to Belgium. And he said, no, 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 I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't fly. And uh, I found that amazing in 2006. And uh, um, 
So I think I'm, I'm a bit inspired by him. But anyway, thank you, uh, Jane Mahatan. Thank you also, uh, Tara Bissett and, and Lola Shepard for this invitation to talk tonight. Um, it, it's been tough for me to decide what I wanted to talk to you about because it's um, uh, it's difficult to choose in, in the, the kind of projects that I've been doing with Roto the, the past uh, two decades almost. Um, so yeah, I hope you will not regret the choices that I made. Um, my talk is going to be rather simply structured. Uh, I will uh, initiate with an intro which is also talking a little bit about the history of, uh, of Rotor, but very shortly. Then I will introduce our latest research. And then afterwards, um, I will dwell a little bit upon the, the, the lessons I think we can draw from it. But uh, I'll start sharing my presentation. I think that's going to be a bit more productive. Actually, I changed the title that was communicated earlier on, and I call this talk now Resisting the Collapse of Reuse Practices, Rotor and Reimakers. I hope you will understand where this is uh, hinting at, but uh, um, you, I guess you'll discover that along the way. So um, a little something about uh, the history of Rotor. This is an image I show to summarize like where we came from when we um, initiated Rotor in 2005. We were not looking so much at the building industry, but more at um, industrial waste production in general. And so what you see here are two objects, which are the results and uh, let's say the repeated result of um, industrial productions and their um, unintended outcomes, so waste products. Um, so on the right hand side, it's uh, a leftover from the injection of polyurethane PU, polyurethane foam to make boots with. On the left hand side, obviously, this is a, a color transition from the uh, production of waste liner, um, yeah, waste bag liners. Now, <laughs> But then very quickly, our interest, that, uh, our interest shifted from, um, let's say, um, industrial waste production to the, the waste production in the building industry in particular, because we realized that if you look at industrial waste, uh, it's, it, these are gigantic proportions compared to municipal waste. And, and so as, um, let's say, citizens were also always uh, encouraged to be very attentive to uh, our uh, municipal waste production, but then the industry is never really, uh, let's say, questioned about their uh, wasteful habits. And then when you look at industrial waste production, the building and demolition uh, sector is, is producing a, a gigantic chunk of that. In particular, in Belgium, we were extremely irritated by the fact that there was such a favoring, a systematic favoring of recycling strategies. Um, when we are talking about uh, the, the management of uh, waste that is issued from uh, building activities, but then mostly from demolition activities. And what you see here is obviously a, a typical demolition site. On the uh, right hand side, you see, um, let's say, the industrial installation that will uh, crush rubble, be it um, bricks or concrete, into a kind of uh, a certified rubble that can then be used for backfill. Um, so this image summarizes the, the, the kind of uh, uh, anger we started with. This is an image from uh, 2009, 2010 maybe. So the realization that you had these amazingly interesting uh, building components such as bricks, these cement tiles or uh, natural stone that were just crushed on an industrial level into a material that is worth nothing per, uh, per ton in, in terms of value, while these original components would have yielded uh, pretty high values per ton from yeah 220 for the bricks to 800 for these ceramic tiles. So we, we um, consider this a kind of industrial destruction of value and it it, it has always questioned us um, how did we come to a situation as this 
We've also been looking um, carefully at the numbers and um, let's say usually when people talk about uh, the performance of the demolition industry and the way in which that demolition industry is trying to, uh, let's say, to, to, to become more sustainable, they will say like, okay, we have a, a recycling rate that is super high for Flanders and Belgium. They would say it's like uh, between 85 and 90 percent of recycling rate. But they never say that the amount of waste is just increasing steadily. And so between 2004 and 2016, you have almost a doubling of the amounts. When we go a bit more back in time, then we see that between uh, then and uh, so the late 90s and today, we have a tripling of the, the amount of building and especially demolition waste that is being produced for our territories. Then you can ask yourself, what is the reason for this? Um, I think there are probably many reasons, but the, uh, one of the main reasons is that buildings have turned into, um, let's say, disposable commodities, just as all the rest that surrounds us, uh, like our clothes and, and our uh, uh, furniture, etc., and our um, electronics. But uh, obviously, the, the environmental impact of trashing your your iPhone is uh, a bit smaller than the, the the impact of trashing a, a gigantic uh, government office building such as this one, which was demolished uh, after not even 30 years of uh, of use. Uh, there has also been um, question of uh, demolishing this iconic building, which is pretty ugly, I agree, but it's uh, it's an important building. It's the seat of the European Parliament in Brussels. Um, we've been involved in, in a little bit in, in the whole issue. Uh, so as a consultant for the commissioner, the European Commission, and it appears that in the end they will not uh, demolish it. So, so it probably will be just refurbished, uh, which is really a good thing. But uh, it's obviously the demolition of mammoth-sized buildings such as these ones that make that, uh, that amount of building and demolition waste material increase. Now, um, what we've been doing is, is uh, in the past years is setting up a whole series of strategies to try, um, on the one hand side, to promote the reuse of components and then to, uh, let's say, hamper or make the the simple demolition and the raising of uh, buildings more complicated. We have been doing that through um, different strategies. Um, this is also already a kind of old slide, but that we used a lot to communicate the different uh, uh, strands of action. Um, so on the one hand side, we were designing ourselves to show like, okay, th this is something you can do if uh, reusing salvage building components in new design projects is feasible and we're going to show you that, that it's feasible. Um, then there's design assistance, which is uh, an activity that has really grown in importance is, and it's probably one of the most important sources of revenue for Rotor, the nonprofit. We did a lot of exhibitions, conferences, and and uh, and teaching. Obviously, um, so the, the, the lecture I'm giving to you right now is is uh, falling within that category. And then there's research. Um, so for a whole while, um, Rotter was a kind of four-legged table um, engaged in these activities until 2014, more or less, when we decided to set up ourselves. Um, an operation in dismantling building components and reselling them. So that uh, was formally founded in 2016 and still exists. It's called uh, Rotor DC. So now these are two separate companies. Uh, we, we send each other invoices uh, once in a while. Um, but essentially, the people are the same. And uh, so Jane visited the, the compounds uh, last year. It's, uh, it's one building in which uh, we are now. It's a former um, office building with uh, a, a huge outdoor storage area and, and also a lot of indoor space. Um, this is the... Um, an image that is from 2016. Um, we now move to, to the, the new location. Back then, we had a team of about 20 people. Now, you have over 30 salaried people at Roto. So it has become a big organization. I, I mean, if you combine the two, um, the nonprofit organization and then the cooperative uh, for profit company, Roto DC. 
these were our warehouses in Anderlecht uh, before we moved to Ever. But as I said, it, it's now, Roto has now become a kind of um, institution um, and we're definitely well known in the city of Brussels where we are part of, um, let's say, the, the whole network of uh, initiatives. Um, we've also been consulting with the, the Brussels government um, a lot and, and it, it has been a kind of um, very uh, enthusiastic partner in the development and the refinement of, um, of policies. So um, one of the things that always has been really important for us was to, um, I mean, under the heading of research, was diving into the past to look at what can be learned from what was happening in the past. And um, I, uh, Jane mentioned this book, De Construction et Reemploi, which is, uh, uh, was issued in 2018 um, as a handbook for the, the reuse of building components and, and how to make these, uh, how to give second and third and fourth lives to, to these elements. Now, um, the first chapter of that book is, is really focusing on the history of, of uh, reuse. And we were absolutely surprised when diving into that history to see that, uh, contrary to uh, what many people might think, actually, <clears throat> it's the present day that is the exception. So for uh, centuries, people have been reusing building components. Um, it was the most normal thing to do. There's, there's like, growing historical evidence that it it, uh, it was a very sophisticated culture that existed in, in uh, salvaging whatever you could find in terms of uh, a beam of wood, a piece of stone, a brick. And it's in the 20th century that that practice has been collapsing. So uh, this is an example that shows that even in the late 19th century, you had an elaborate um, culture of uh, organizing um, through, for instance, this uh, sales for demolition. So it's uh, um, an advertisement to contractors uh, to invite them to um, tender for the demolition of this uh, 15th century tower around the city of Antwerp. So it's the, the city is growing by the end of the 19th century. This structure needs to disappear um, contrary to what would be the current practice today where uh, the city would pay for a contractor to get rid of the structure. In these days, um, let's say the city would receive money from the contractor in exchange for the, the building materials that were, uh, let's say, embedded in the tower itself. And so the highest bidder wins the, the, the tender and, um, and runs with the materials, so to speak. Obviously, this, this is a context in which um, you have manpower that is cheap. You have the value of materials that are still pretty high. So you have a kind of balance that that um, is inverted from the reality we are living in now. But we'll probably come back on that issue later. Um, <clears throat> so Rotor today is is uh, one of the activities that it does. I was talking about the, the counseling for the Brussels government that we are doing. Um, giving advice on, uh, to public authorities on, on how to develop a policy that would encourage um, reuse and circular um, well, waste management practices is, uh, is obviously an important uh, part of our activity. But uh, I will not dwell too long on that because it's, it's really administrative and, and uh, I think some of you have been uh, exposed to it as well, for instance, in, in the workshop that uh, I, uh, I gave this morning. Um, on request of a few students who were there this morning, I, I will show one tiny uh, design project, um, which is a recent one, um, but I think it illustrates well the, the, the way in which we try and deal with uh, design projects. So it, it's it's actually a double project and it starts with this building, which is a building in the city of Ostens uh, that is on the, the coast of Belgium. So uh, um, a seaside town where you have this, um, let's say, warehouse or it's, it's uh, um, how do you call that? Um, uh, 
a store, a multi-level store of a cooperative company that was really important for the city of uh, uh, Ostend in the 1920s, 30s and 40s. Um, yeah, you might call it a department store, but then for a cooperative, it was built by a renowned um, uh, modernist architect who's a kind of epicon of uh, um, Le Corbusier back then. It's a beautiful building. It was, uh, uh, let's say, typical for um, a reinforced concrete structure with uh, gigantic windows and, and uh, um, very huge spaces. Um, it became then later on um, a mu museum of contemporary art in the 80s. And a funny thing with the museums of contemporary art is that um, you, you will see them evolve to uh, a situation where spaces get increasingly cluttered with, um, let's say, uh, MDF uh, or um, Gibson board walls to be able to hang as many artworks as possible. They will also block out the light. Um, so you had a, a logic that that intervened of uh, that, that was completely contradicting the original building. This is an image that gives you an idea of how we discovered the space when uh, we were invited to intervene on, on this. Um, our intervention or the invitation to intervene on it was one of, uh, uh, there was virtually no budget. Uh, this was in the COVID period. The museum had to reinvent itself very quickly to organize an opening that uh, um, had to, let's say, celebrate the, the arrival of a new director. Um, because with COVID, uh, th there was a kind of general depression within the, the, the personnel of the museum. And they needed like uh, an injection of uh, adrenaline, but they had like virtually no money. So um, the, one of their ideas was that we would just take all the clutter away, get back to the raw concrete of the original and then uh, design some kind of scenography within that. Um, what we did was was not exactly that. So we um, decided to restore part of the original uh, spatial experiences of the building, but not to take everything away because otherwise you would have to bring again a new scenography. So in terms of the, the, the kinds of material streams in and out of the building, you would have generated a kind of, uh, um, yeah, uh, a gigantic clutter that we, we absolutely wanted to avoid. So our strategy was focused on extracting just right enough and not too much of the materials present in, in the building and and uh, and to leave in place everything that we thought was still useful. So this is exactly the same view after the, um, let's say, removal of the, the gypsum board and the MDF panels of one of these freestanding um, uh, staircases in the, the first level space. Yeah, I could go uh, in detail into this project, which I'm not going to do. But in in um, what I wanted to mention is that in, in parallel, we had another um, uh, invitation to intervene on an uh, art space in Antwerp, another uh, Flemish city in, in Belgium, where you had um, an early 20th century um, neo-Gothic style that was being turned into a, a contemporary art space. What they needed there was, a, a, let's say, a, a kind of um, an intervention that was at, at the least intrusive possible. But one of the, the equipments they needed for this new art space was to have one little pavilion at the entrance of this uh, former church that would house the, the kind of doorkeeper. So the the, um, the person that will keep an eye on the exhibition space. And in the meantime, um, the idea was to, to protect him or her and to allow them not to freeze in, in the winter time when temperatures tend to be pretty cold in the, in the exhibition space. Uh, and since it's a former church, so um, what we did was we, we said like, okay, we extracted um, uh, these MDF panels from the former um, museum that I showed in Austin. Why not try and design the pavilion in, in uh, Antwerp with that material? Obviously, this was painted MDF 
so you see here the extraction and, and the transport from these panels from um, from one city to the other. Painted MDF is like the most ungrateful material you could ever imagine uh, in terms of the, the tactile pleasure. It's 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 really uh, the worst you can get, and in in some bizarre and slightly perverse way that triggered us and and uh, it made us enthusiastic. Um, so we tried to to exploit the these these uh, um, rather shitty qualities of, of that material and to turn it into something exciting, exploiting the, the let's say the contrasting color that you have between that painted. Uh, flat surface and then the edges of the, the, the rather raw edges of the, the, the MDF panels. And we were uh, looking at books on, on uh, uh, classical modernitures and uh, um, like say moldings um, from Greek and Roman architecture to see if there was something we could do uh, that would resemble a bit the denticules that you have in these uh, um, traditional um, um, ornamental languages. And then we came up with this design, which is the pavilion in question, like uh, uh, strategically uh, located at the entrance of, uh, of the church, exclusively realized with that MDF, uh, these MDF panels. Um, so the only other material that has been introduced in, in this construction are the, the um, the plexi elements of the windows, but uh, but for the rest, it's it's just pure salvaged uh, MDF. It's it's an instance where um, a lot of carpenting went into this. Uh, nothing was was uh, cut by CNC as you would expect today. So, let's say uh, the carpenter who took care of it um, grudgingly in the beginning, but in the end, I think he he uh, uh, pulled a lot of satisfaction out of it was really applied at uh, realizing all these details. It's uh, it's obviously one of the rare uh, rotor projects where we engaged in, in ornamentation, but I hope you understand the logic a bit. So um, just just a kind of uh, example of uh, one rotor project. Um, I think it, it illustrates a little bit the spirit with which we approach commissions such as this one. And um, it's not domestic, as some of, of you asked, but uh, I think it it, uh, it approaches the uh, kind of domestic spirit. There's another view of the same uh, installation. Now, <clears throat> let's shift to the recent research project that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, <clears throat> But before I do that, I will, I will say a few words on uh, Opalis. So um, when uh, I, I, um, I talked about our counseling work to um, public authorities on, on how to improve, um, let's say, more circular practices on a national level, this project is probably the, the most important one that we ever engaged in. It, it's also the longest running project by uh, uh, Rotor. So uh, it's Opalis, which is an anagram of Spolia. Um, if you're a little bit uh, interested in, in um, let's say, architectural history, you probably know what Spolia are. These are the, the um, let's say, um, salvaged or, or dismantled components that are used in, in uh, classical architecture for instance, a Roman temple that would be dismantled and transformed into um, um, an early Christian or Byzantine um, temple. That is an example of the use of spolia. Anyway, we didn't want to use spolia as a term, but, but we wanted to refer to it, so it has become opalis. Um, it was an effort to inventorize or identify professional resellers of uh, um, second-hand building components that were already existing. So the idea was uh, we, we, we got the message early on, even 2010, people were telling us like reuse is impossible, nobody's doing it, uh, nobody's selling it. And then we, we uh, let's say we wanted to say like, um, no, we will show that you're wrong uh, because you have this long list of operators that are doing exactly that. They're um, dismantling building components and they're reselling them. So this illustrates the, the uh, 
one of the first stages of the um, documentary effort uh, for Opalis of identifying these professional resellers of secondhand building components uh, over the Belgian territory. So initially we were uh, we, we did it with Brussels money and so we were looking at that green spot which is uh, all the businesses at one hour drive from Brussels. Eventually we ended up covering the whole of uh, the Belgian territory. And then later on with new money from Europe, we, uh, we, we covered France, the Netherlands and uh, um, in, in partnership with Salvo, uh, also the UK. So um, the website gives you address now to hundreds of resellers in, in those countries. Uh, Luxembourg is also included right now. Um, that was obviously done with uh, new grant money from uh, the Interreg um, FCRPE project. but. It's a different story. Um, if you go on the Opalis website now, you will, um, so this is the homepage, you will see um, as a result of all the, the work we did, the interviews, the, the photographs we took on site, um, you will have this detailed overview of um, resellers. It's important to know that uh, none of this is sponsored. So this is all, uh, we, we try to make it objective content. It's a kind of uh, as objective as possible review of what these companies stand for, what they're specialized in, what their expertise is, where, which materials they, they are uh, um, focusing on and have uh, stocks of. Um, and there it's interesting to see that you, you have uh, uh, specializations for each of these uh, um, Businesses are usually specialized in either uh, salvaged lumber, uh, salvaged bricks, natural stone, uh, steel structures, etc. This, for instance, is one company called uh, Carrière de la Azote. They sell, uh, it's a quarry. They still extract uh, virgin stone from the mountain, but they also sell uh, secondhand cobblestones. So it's uh, it's an interesting combination of uh, uh, two different types of business, but obviously uh, in the same vein. Um, the the website is also providing material documentation on specific uh, good candidates for reuse um, and for integration in, in newly designed projects. But the Palace project, that's why I mentioned it, brought us in contact with uh, Marcel Reimakers, the, the, the topic of the, or the core topic of my, my talk tonight. So Marcel Reimakers, we, we met him um, on one of the first tours of Opalis in 2011. Um, this is a picture taken by Benjamin Lasser, uh, a colleague of mine. I wasn't there at that time. And he, he photographed the, um, uh, let's say, the outdoor storage space of this pretty renowned uh, secondhand uh, salvage dealer in northeastern Belgium. Um, and this is actually the shed where the um, stone workers were having their tools and, and doing their stuff. So uh, it's such a big company that they were uh, reassembling the stony elements and they needed uh, a, a shed where all that stonework could be done. Um, we loved the aesthetics of this building. Uh, we found it really intriguing. But all the, the aesthetics of the rest of the compound, which you will see is pretty interesting, was just too complex for us to grasp. And so this is how we uh, got first intrigued by this person. In the end, um, after a few visits, we realized that this was not just a company that was reselling building components. The man behind it, uh, called Marcel Reimakers, was also a designer and actually he just used the the, the company to um, let's say to find the materials that he integrated in his own design projects now um, it for us it was such an interesting topic that we wrote a, a, an entire book about it um, you have two versions one in dutch one in english the official launch of the English version book was yesterday, so that's why I'm, I'm looking a little bit tired, but also why I, I just can't stop talking about this project because we're so uh, eager to show it to um, the public. Um, but so subtitle is Marcel Reimacher's Salvage Architecture in Post-War Belgium. I will try now in the, the, the next 10 or 15 minutes to, to convince you that this is an interesting topic to look at. 
Um, so first there is the, the flamboyant personality of uh, Marcel Reimakers. Um, you may or may not see this on, on the picture here. He, he, he comes over as the caricature of an artist. He still does. He's still alive today. He's, he's over 90, but he's still dressed in the same way, like uh, the pointed collar, the silk scarf, uh, the magnetic eyes. It's a, a guy with a, a, a very charismatic personality and uh, uh, that, that still works in a way, even if he's now bankrupt. Um, he's, uh, uh, his agency is, is far limited in comparison to, to uh, the, the mountains he could uh, move when he was in his 30s and 40s. Now, these are two uh, newspaper clippings uh, that we uh, that are part of the gigantic um, pile of documentation that we found on, on, on this man. But it's interesting to point at the title of this uh, newspaper article. It is in the Bauwereld ben ik een ketter in, uh, in Dutch uh, to English that would translate as in the building world, I'm an heretic. And I think you definitely can label him as a heretic um, for many, many, many reasons. So this slide gives you an overview of the projects that for the book we were able to identify. Um, so the black dots are um, just uh, identified projects that are in, in the list at the back of the book. Then the, the, the ones that are numbered are uh, illustrated in more detail in, uh, in, in the book itself. Um, but I will go focus on, on a few of them. Um, but first, uh, one word about uh, Marcel Reimakers. He was um, born in a, a very rural family uh, in Flanders. Um, so he's, he was absolutely not predestined to become uh, an artist uh, or uh, an, an architect and actually he received a training in the um, uh, technical drawing so um, uh, at an architecture school but he was so he, he, he was a technical draughtsman which would have not entitled him to become an architect but uh, 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 let's say he, he still did it, but even that training as a technical draughtsman, he never finished it. So he dropped out before finishing his studies because he was too bored uh, with the whole thing. Um, and so there's uh, the, the the setting in which he developed his work is uh, is this. This is uh, an aerial photograph of contemporary Limburg, which is the province in which he, he was uh, op operative. So uh, actually the whole can you see the uh, my pointer, my uh, mouse? Yeah. So this province here is called Limburg, and the, the core of his uh, building activity has been taking place there. Uh, you must imagine that in in um, the early 20th century, in a landscape like this, you would have virtually not one have had not one house, a few farms. For the rest, uh, it would uh, just have been flat plains, uh, partially natural landscape and partially, um, let's say, agriculture, but uh, uh, in tough conditions because the, the earth is really not so fertile there or was. Now it's, it has been become that urban sprawl that characterizes much of the, the Flemish landscape. Um, he started in the 1950s with designing these kind of homes, um, but that was always as a side activity. So he had a, an elementary job um, working for uh, public authorities usually. And then on the side, during the evenings, the night, uh, at his job, he was designing for several people. This is his own home. Um, later on, uh, in also in the 50s, he designed houses like that. But this is the kind of work that he considered afterwards as completely irrelevant and non-interesting, even if he designed, according to himself, hundreds of these houses. Um, now, he got a training in the arts in 1960-61 which was just a degree that should have helped him to be able to teach uh, art at secondary schools, also as a, a elementary jobs. But that is, it was a moment of revelation for him. And it made him discover the, the whole practice of the uh, found object in art. So you have these sculptures who used found objects and integrated them, uh, like Duchamp and so many others in their work 
for him that was like a, a, a revelation and he started to apply that strategy in his own work these uh, gigantic boulders um, with which this chimney is being masoned is uh, our boulders that are um, let's say carried along the, the main river that runs alongside Limburg the province uh, which is the Meuse river they're coming from France and they were uh, hauled uh, over uh, thousands of years by big chunks of ice um, so that's the reason why they eventually ended up in that the alluvial plains uh, of the river uh, Meuse he designed these uh, amazing that amazing house which is uh, um, a rare use of shingles in in Flemish architecture otherwise uh, it, it, it it's virtually not used Th this house is co conceptualized as a kind of suspended bird's nest but remarkably it is virtually completely built with salvaged materials uh, the only not salvaged material here are the shingles themselves but the brick wall you see in the back here is all salvage bricks uh, and in the inside uh, as well this is another building um, a doctor's practice where the the inside of the uh, the, the doctor's cabinet is lined with uh, salvaged aluminum sheeting that has been hammered by a friend artist uh, with these amazing patterns. Um, and then you have this spectacular home, which is also made from uh, gigantic oak beams that were salvaged from um, like agricultural uh, infrastructure in the region with which he built these three pyramids covered completely with uh, salvaged tiles and in which he integrated um, these amazing windows, which actually are cupolas from jet fighters that he uh, that were just uh, um, had become obsolete. These were the first jet fighters that uh, the Belgian army had been flying with. He found them on some kind of uh, second-hand reselling place and integrated them in this um, amazing home, which is also, uh, it combines a house and uh, uh, the doctor's cabinet. It still stands exactly uh, the way it was conceived and the, the cupolas are still doing their job amazingly well. So you saw these uh, gigantic Meuse boulders and, and the uh, jet fighter cupolas. Um, they're typical of, of, uh, of his work, but then um, along the way he would shift his attention um, to one of the, the most amazing and inexhaustible uh, sources of um, uh, found construction materials, which are the, the debris um, of all the demolitions that were taking place in the, um, the big cities of Belgium in, in that period. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you have huge chunks of historic uh, city fabric that were demolished um, for the modernization, so-called modernization of the cities. And, and that was where he uh, went to, to scout for materials he would integrate in, in his uh, structures. And these are the materials with which he, he built his central hub, um, the, which is, would then later be called the Queen of the South which is a gigantic, uh, um, let's say, exchange point for salvage building materials. The interesting thing is that the, the materials on sale are also composing the, the, um, the shop themselves. So they're literally built from uh, what is going to be sold in that spot. Here you see one of the early images of uh, the, the site which is a, a long uh, national road between the two biggest uh, urban agglomeration of the province. And this is an aerial view of uh, the Queen of the South, where you see the main building uh, is here. The shed we were talking about is located here. And here, for instance, you have a gigantic uh, door pavilion. Uh, it's an, an um, indoor showroom. Uh, you have another showroom on the ground floor here as well. All the rest is outdoor showroom for the, um, let's say, salvaged elements that can be um, stored outside. Now, the funny thing about this location is that it was not simply a showroom for the reselling of uh, secondhand building components. It was also a bar, like a, a pretty luxurious bar. Uh, he called it estaminé, which is a, a typically Belgian term uh, for this kind of uh, cozy pub-like uh, bar venue. 
Um, but then on the first floor, you had a, a, a restaurant, which was uh, pretty elaborate as well. Um, I won't go into the detail, but the, again, everything you see here is uh, salvage. This is a view from the outside and you, you will see that this is its architecture of which you might think, okay, this is like a 17th century mansion uh, or maybe it's Rococo. I can't tell exactly. You have to imagine that all of this was built in one year, 1972. And it's really a kind of uh, um, cluster of um, very different style um, elements and, and, uh, and materials as well. So the name Queen of the South comes from this ship. Um, it's a steamer that is uh, uh, originally it was um, used on a river in Scotland and then eventually it moved to uh, the Thames in London and got the name Queen of the South, which is inscribed on the paddle um, board of, uh, of the steamer. This is an element that he found uh, um, by a, a a dealer who had uh, access to these dismantled components. This is the the, uh, the billboard that was announcing the kind of services he was offering, which is like uh, aesthetic ratgeving means aesthetic counseling. Uh, and these are salvaged building materials, uh, revamped objects, antiques. And here uh, in big letters is written one cultus meaning the cult of living. Um, so he's, he was actually not only selling materials, he was selling a kind of lifestyle. He was uh, selling in a way dreams of nobility to the people uh, and uh, in, in the first place to, to like the real the middle class of Limburg. Uh, this is, as I said, it was an empty landscape in the early 20th century. So it's, it's not the kind of place where you had an already established uh, aristocracy or something. It was uh, um, um, mostly middle class or working class people. And the, the, this was the place where they could dream of their own uh, uh, aristocracy. A few views of um, the outdoor showroom. As you see, it's gigantic. And then, yeah, um, Marcel Reimacher, this is one of the first television interviews uh, in which he appears, is uh, developed from the late 16s on uh, a kind of very personal lifestyle. Um, Antique elements, uh, you see the, the, the kind of uh, aesthetics that he surrounded himself with. Um, a, a very, let's say, countercultural uh, attitude, uh, provocative towards the, the, um, the Catholic establishment of the time, but uh, the beginning of his signature identity. But then along the way, um, the, the let's say, that style turned into something uh, more explicitly geared towards uh, the, that evocation of nobility. And uh, um, let's say the restaurant it was a kind of, uh, was a very chic place here. You see one of his uh, partners who was managing the restaurant, uh, who was uh, uh, serving customers there. Um, and here you see Marcel with his wife in the apartment that he built uh, uh, for her on top of the Queen of the South in the, the late 1970s. So they gradually develop into some kind of castle lords of their own domain. Um, yeah, the, in 1979, they also received the, the most famous Belgian writer, Hugo Klaus, for uh, his 50th birthday party. Uh, of which you see a few uh, stills here. It, it has been filmed by the Dutch television. You had a series of very important uh, Dutch writers present at that party. You had 50 people for his 50th birthday. And it, so a very exclusive event in a very exclusive venue. Um, so the, the, it's funny, but the, um, Marcel Reimachers used the, the, the restaurant. Uh, there was also a jazz venue uh, next to the restaurant. 
uh, and the cafe as a magnet or uh, an attraction pole for, um, let's say, an up and coming uh, elite in the province. Uh, so the idea was that he, if he could attract them as customers for the restaurant, they would also be good customers for uh, his architecture and his, uh, his salvage building components. Now, where did he get these materials? Uh, and that is where it gets interesting because it talks about an evolving uh, landscape. Back in the 1960s and 70s, you still had um, ship dismantling and salvage yards in Belgium. Uh, this is close to Antwerp on the Scheldt River, a location where ships were being dismantled um, and, uh, and their components sorted. I showed you that aluminum um, interior of the, the doctor's cabinet. Uh, well, that was a sheet coming from uh, one of the ships where it, it was covering the hulls. And that is where Marcel went to pick out exactly those uh, sheets of, of copper, of aluminum or steel that he wanted to integrate in his buildings. It's obviously the kind of infrastructure that today absolutely no longer exists in Belgium. Uh, of course, we have been subcontracting all that kind of work, which is easily displaceable, of course, uh, to the global south. Um, and uh, it obviously also means that we have no access anymore to these kinds of uh, um, dismantled waste materials. Architecture, on the contrary, still uh, <laughs> remains on top. It's, it's difficult to go and subcontract the demolition of, uh, uh, of this kind of mansion to the global south, so it, it, it still happens on the spot. And this is an image taken from Reimacher's own archive, and it shows um, uh the uh, let's say a demolition that is occurring taking place and uh, for Reimacher's uh, photographs like these were exchanged with his uh, the, the network of his suppliers which could be demolition contractors but also wholesalers of uh, architectural salvage so you had a whole um and that is vastly undocumented network of these people um, and so for us this project was a, a first step into discovering how that that the network functioned and and who were the the main players in it we discovered that one of the main players for the brussels demolition scene for instance was a guy who was illiterate so he he, he couldn't even i mean i mean he had obviously no bookkeeping uh, or no no archival records uh, so everything was dealt with orally, um, and there's one interesting document in that context, which is uh, um, an, um, the picture here. It's a, a Polaroid on which you have these tags with prices. So you see that this portal was sold as a whole for this um, uh, for these prices. Uh, so the idea was to. to isolate those elements that could become an autonomous system and could be reintegrated in, in new architecture as well. Um, yeah, this is an image of, of uh, Marcel. Um, it's an extract from a television report where you see him walking on the side of a castle that is being demolished because uh, the, the owner can't, repair, can't pay for the repairs anymore. Obviously, it's also a period in which um, for many of the owners of these huge properties with the 19th century structure on it, it became more uh, financially more interesting to raise the structure and to, uh, let's say, uh, sell the whole property as a, a different kind of tiny lots. Um, it, it yields more money. So you have a kind of a, a gigantic amount of, of structures like these ones that have been demolished in, in these decades as well. Um, and then here a few images of the way in which the showroom of the Queen of the South was a kind of, um, let's say, using enchantment technology to convince the, the, the buyer to uh, um, go for a piece. So you, you have a very elaborate system where the, the restaurant also plays a very important role um, that is meant to convince the, the, the customer that uh, that piece that he sees there is really the, the right um, element for his home and uh, and then to bring to buy it. 
so yeah, you see they, they, they were even selling these Solomonic columns, uh, very elaborate antique uh, elements, um, which I will not uh, dive into too much in detail. Uh, a few views of the interior from the time. And then a picture of uh, uh, <clears throat> Marcel Reimax with his wife, Hilde Bracken, and um, a chef that they convinced at that moment to work for them, Evert Thiele. At some moment, they even had a Michelin star, but it, it didn't last too long. But it, it gives you an idea of the ambitions they had with that restaurant and how important it was to, to run their business. Yeah, a few other images of the restaurants. And then uh, one word on the way in which he worked for design. So this is a view from um, the, let's say, the storage space outside uh, the Queen of the South. You have to imagine this as being also a kind of checkerboard on which Marcel was uh, capable of trying out compositions when he was designing something new. You have to imagine him really working with these components as if they were building blocks and assembling and reassembling them to try out a new composition using obviously an elevator clock or something to do so. And here you see him like uh, reassembling a portal to uh, um, uh, and obviously assessing what this could uh, mean in, in a new project. Um, so it's uh, there's a, a huge amount of playfulness in that practice as well. This is um, a flower shop that was uh, composed for a client who wanted uh, this kind of uh, facade for a flower shop. Um, and the intriguing thing is that except for the brick, which is obviously reclaimed, but coming from somewhere else, but all these natural stone elements are coming from one facade, which looked completely different in, in its original version. So this is the original facade from um, an architect's uh, um, building in the city of Antwerp. That building was raised to make place for a parking, sadly enough, in 1980, so, uh, 86, sorry, so pretty late. Um, but then the facade was sold as one set of blocks. They arrived on pallets at uh, the Queen of the South and Marcel transformed it in, in that new facade. Um, some people say that he the, the ornate decoration of the, the frieze that you have here uh, under the cornice uh, was so interesting that he brought it down um, so that people could observe it uh, from closer by. Um, so here is the uh, beautiful drawing made by one of my master's students, uh, Rope van der Meinsbrugge, of the whole shift of elements from uh, one organization to the other. Yeah, a few other images of uh, yeah, illustrating the fact that Marcel Reimer was also absolutely no fan of drawing as a communication tool. So he actually used the, the, the building components as the tool for the communication with the client. So this is the client here and this is the contractor. So you have that triangulation of uh, between those two, uh, the, those three, obviously uh, main protagonists of the, of the act of building, but it all centers around the building component itself. Yeah, and then you have obviously uh, again testimony of that kind of playfulness in in his work. These a festen is obviously meant to to hang this way. Uh, but here he had two of these and, and he just symmetrically um, put them on top of each other, creating something that is totally unseen in architecture, but, but pretty funny if you, you uh, know what, what has been had going on there. Yeah, this is a home that we found in, in its uh, construction picture so amazing that we wanted to put it on the cover of the book. It's, it's a home that is actually the, the collusion between uh, one slaughterhouse that has been dismantled on the one hand side and army barracks. Uh, so you, you, you see that monumental entrance door uh, flanked by these two little, um, how do you call that? Manholes where uh, you, you had originally soldiers standing there to, uh, to stand guard. Um, so it's a, a pretty improbable structure. It has an amazing plan that is also illustrating um, Reimacher's really personal ideas about uh, uh, privacy and, and uh, retreat. So the plan of this home is spiraling upwards. 
But the interesting thing is that it was also um, very much a result of self-building. So actually the family who commissioned this building had been doing the dismantling of the slaughterhouse of uh, the, the city of Terlemont themselves. So here you see the father of the family who is lacking one hand, who still is very enthusiastically engaged in the work of, of tearing that building down. And afterwards they will be cleaning each of these bricks to integrate them in their new home. So this is a practice that uh, actually was, was uh, I was talking before uh, uh, about these, uh, the fact that um, reuse has along the centuries never really ended or it has always been um, a very common practice and it's only the 20th century who made that uh, practice disappear but so in rural communities uh, you still had a long tradition even deep into the 20th century of doing so and these people are just continuing that tradition but so uh, bricks typically are um, sorry the kind of material that uh, Reimakers would not salvage himself through his company but he would ask his customers to do it uh, on their own. So he's not bothering with it, but he, he starts from the idea that would, they would integrate it. Um, so yeah, obviously it's uh, to illustrate the whole idea of the participation, um, the, uh, the, a lot of, um, let's say, workers, have been involved in, in the realization of these structures. Sometimes it's the commissioners themselves. As you see here, these are uh, miners from um, uh, a jazz band or um, uh, fanfare, as we call them, who build their own premises. They do it themselves. These are some of the workers of uh, uh, Marcel himself, his carpenters, uh, who played obviously an important role in, in this work. Now, uh, having said all this and shown this, uh, I think it, it was like a quick overview of this, this work of uh, Reimakers. The, the question is, what can we learn from this? Um, and obviously the book tries to answer many of the questions there. Um, but I, I will try and rehearse some of them in, in what follows. Um, so if we want to summarize Master Reimakers and his practice in a few bullet points, you might say that, okay, he has no formal education as an architect, so he was never um, recognized by the order of architects, which is normally the, like the, the legal uh, precondition to, to be able to exercise uh, the, the practice. So in, in principle, he had no capacity to sign plans, endorse responsibilities, etc. Yet he always found architects that were willing in exchange for some pay to put their names on, on his plan. So he, he managed to um, find a way to, to go for it. One of the elements that is really striking in his work is that he refuses to use industrial produced materials. It was his way of um, or his form of counterculture in a way. So he's very explicitly refusing modernism and modernity, especially in the form of industrially produced building materials. So it only worked with waste materials from demolitions or waste from extraction processes. As I mentioned, there is a high degree of participation in, on the building site. Um, the commissioner and his family members or her family members unemployed minors, um, you, you have many old people that were, um, let's say, um, hired on these building sites just to earn a few extra, uh, extra money at the end of the month. Um, but uh, you, it's a period in which you also had many uh, strikes in the mines. Limburg is, is also a mining region, so um, you had a lot of miners with these strikes. You had many moments where they, they were unemployed, unemployed and, and uh, it was um, useful for them to, to find these uh, extra jobs. The funny thing is that he produced probably the most circular body of work of post-war building. Uh, if we look at it in tons, we are talking about thousands of tons of uh, reused building materials. So the scale of it of this operation is is just gigantic, 
uh, a total disrespect of planning regulation is also very characteristic. And then a, a, a systematic abandonment of the separation between the role of the designer and the contractor. So, um, <clears throat> typically, um, let's say, your contractor is responsible for providing the, the building materials. In this case, no, the designer himself is the reseller of building components. And then there's one aspect that is really characteristic of this work is that uh, from early on, it happens even in the late 60s, the designs that uh, Reimakers develops are completely free of charge. Uh, his only way to generate an income is that he takes a, a sizable percentage on the sale of the salvaged components. Yeah. So uh, the question is then, what can we learn from this? Um, well, maybe it's, it's not only from the work of, of, uh, of Rai Marcus, but, and it's also something that we've learned through our own practice, but uh, uh, what we can learn from it is how much the current building system is reuse averse. Um, especially when we look at, at the work of Rai Marcus and, and we ask ourselves, could we do this today? The, 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 let's say the, the conclusion would definitely be no, it's totally impossible for several reasons. Um, so in, in Belgium, like in many European countries, you had a law that was introduced in 1949, which imposes a strict separation of the role of the architect on the one hand side and the contractor on the other. So the architect, the architect is responsible for the design, the contractor is responsible for the procurement of building materials and ex the execution of the works. Now, <clears throat> If you take that separation very strictly uh, or very seriously, then it becomes pretty complicated to integrate uh, on a systematic basis uh, salvaged components. So it makes you ponder about that law, obviously, and, and uh, uh, the relevance of that law. Um, the second element is that the procurement process focuses on warranties on paper of the quality of building materials. These warranties actually require lab testing facilities and uh, in practice these are only feasible for bigger industrial production plants because they have uh, quality control in any case, they have the lab, they have the equipment, um, so for them it's easy. These warranties also prohibit last minute changes in materials, so uh, all decisions need to be taken in advance once the plans and specifications are ready and the procurement starts. Um, now, we sometimes compare uh, a practice like that of uh, Reimakers with the, the, that of jazz musician. He was really improvising and he had that capacity of changing a uh, scenario on the last uh, moment. So uh, if there was something not working, you could just take another component and replace it with it. So improvising on the building side. The current system is completely uh, um, refusing these kinds of uh, procedures. And then, um, yeah, a planning permit trajectory uh, further enhances the idea of a project that needs to be completely final in its minute details uh, before a project can start. Um, that again is very in contradiction with the whole idea of, of uh, working with uh, improvised uh, heterogeneous materials like uh, salvaged materials. <laughs> Sorry. So, a second element of what, what can we learn from this? Um, is, and maybe I'm shifting here to our position today, uh, and also probably my position at the university now, in contrast with what, what I was doing before, is uh, how much the university is at the heart of this system. Um, so probably far more than, than we've uh, uh, been taught when uh, being, being trained ourselves, the building material the materials industry has been shaping the nature of our building industry and something that we we don't realize before we start looking at um, the practices that completely refuse that logic like the, the ones of uh, uh, Reimakers. 
I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, the quadrivium industrial complex uh, pointed out by uh, Mark Jarzenbeck. It's uh, that uh, cluster of the big uh, four uh, building materials, like you have uh, concrete, you have glass, you have steel, and you have the plastics. These are the four material families that are completely dominating the market that is supplying the building industry. And it, it's not to be underestimated how tremendously huge the power is of these, com of these uh, companies to the sense that they, they have turned into kind of a complex uh, akin to the military industrial complex. That at least is the point of Marc Jarzombek, but I tend to agree. Then you have that logic of the Thanatos scene, um, maybe a bit too complex to dive into uh, too deeply right now, but the point made by an author like Lewis Mumford is to say that the virgin resource industries, um, such as the industry of steel and cement, were beefed up during uh, and after the world wars um, and needed once the war ended uh, a consumer market for their products. And that turned uh, in, in both cases to be uh, or, or appeared to be the, the building industry. So uh, that is one of the points made by Lewis Mumford in a book like uh, Techniques and Civilization, where he, he focuses really on the, 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 the way in which the war industry has been shaping our economies. And like the battlefield has been inventing the, the whole idea of a consumer market, because the battlefield is that place where everything gets destroyed. So for uh, an industry, it's, it's just the ideal cons consumer. Um, yeah, um, and I will not focus too much on this. And then y y you have that realization that a highly mechanized industrial production for these building materials is, is um, by definition, a capital intensive one. I, I showed that image of a, a cement kiln. So the natural partners for process optimization for these kind of industries are university laboratories. Um, the, Gustave Maniel is, is uh, um, a professor who was very much engaged in that at my own university in Ghent. Um, but it also means that you have a high level of sponsoring of the, the building industry uh, through research, exhibition, architectural awards by the steel and cement industries. We were talking about the Holcim Awards um, earlier on uh, with uh, Lona. It's, it's one good example. Um, so th the question is, what is then to be done from the university, from our positions? Uh, I will very quickly uh, point at a, a series of uh, uh, possibilities. I think that focusing on uh, the history of reuse, uh, so as, as an element of the, the architectural um, history, can help you illustrate how much consumerism in the built sector is a 20th century invention. Um, these are two slides from a colleague of mine, Simon Barker, who came to teach at Ghent last year in the course of building uh, materials ecologies. Um, he's showing an, uh, a pediment, a pediment of the porticus of Octavia in Rome, which you see here on the left-hand side on, uh, let's say, the, the face that is um, pointed towards the public. If you then look at the backhand side of the same portico, you will see that it's it's a combination of just salvage components that have then be smoothed on the visible side, uh, while on on the invisible side you see just the roughness and the the uh, mixed origins of the components. Um, a second thing we can do is unravel our biases. So. Uh, Focus on the history of the ties between the academic world and the extractive industries. I think that's an urgent uh, uh, point to our agenda. Um, yeah, this is just an example of how uh, scientific publication is, is uh, sometimes explicitly sponsored by the, the extractive industries. Um, and then we have to identify our opponents. Um, the extractive industries, we have to identify the allies. Um, we have to promote interdisciplinary research um, <clears throat> that the, on, for instance, circular procurement uh, or on architectural uh, consumerism. And 
we have to celebrate and promote manpower because that is what we definitely need uh, if we want to evolve towards a, a, a more circular economy. And finally, we have to introduce students to real situations. I will just finish with a few images of a, a, a course I taught at the TU Delft, where we looked at the Hermann Herzberger uh, building that was going to be torn down. It's the Ministry of Social Affairs in the city of The Hague. It has been completely demolished now. It was an amazing building. But with our students, we've been dismantling some of its components and then uh, um, looked at the, the salvageability of these uh, these elements, uh, which are amazing Herzberger designs. And I will end with this image. I'm sorry that I was uh, a bit longer than anticipated, but thank you.